This year, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, begins at sundown Friday, October 11th, and ends at nightfall Saturday, October 12th. It's written Yom Ha Kippurim, the Day of Atonement. In the Old Testament covenant, the Lord said that the only way you could receive cleansing from your sin is by offering a sacrifice on an altar that's been dedicated and deemed holy. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. The word atonement is translated from the Hebrew kafar, which means to cover over, to make an atonement for the soul. So Yom Kippur is both a ceremonial feast for the Jews, but it's also a prophecy that lays out exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ would later completely fulfill. So why is blood required on the Day of Atonement? Leviticus says, because the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement, a kippur for your souls. This is a great mystery. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Because the word life is translated from the Hebrew nephesh, which is translated soul 475 times in the Old Testament. The soul is what gives life and presence of being to the flesh, the batsar, the physical body. And it is the blood sprinkled on the altar of sacrifice that makes a atonement or a covering for your nephesh or your soul. But in this passage, the word soul is written a different way. It's written nephesh otikam. Here's the word nephesh, soul. But it's followed by the tav, the yod, the kaf, and the mem. And it represents what happens in the spirit realm when someone in faith submits their soul to yod heh vav he on the Day of Atonement. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you will do no work at all, Leviticus says except you will afflict, ana, you will humble and submit your soul to yad heh vav heh during this blood covenant rite. Again, soul is written, nefesh otikam. In other words, the Lord, when he sees the blood on the altar, your nefesh, which is the spark of divine life that makes you who you are and sculpts the unique passions and desires and emotions that make you you, your soul, submitted to the altar, receives the mark of a tav written over it. Tav is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it represents a sign or a mark of covenant with yad heh vav -Hey. This is how, in the last days, the angels of God will be able to separate the righteous from the ungodly because they can see the tav, the mark of covenant, that's written over the soul. And in ancient times, in what we call Paleo-Hebrew, the Tav was written like a cross. So when the angels see the cross, they know that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And Tav is followed by the letter Yod, the tenth letter. It resembles a closed or a closing hand that represents a finished work. It's the new creation reality that God has designed and created for you to step into. And it begins to open up as it is revealed to the eyes of your understanding. And all of this begins to take place on the day or the moment of atonement. And at the same time, the next letter, the 11th letter in the alphabet, the cough begins to operate in your life as well. Cough represents an open hand of the Lord's blessing representing that he's lifting you higher and higher into the realms of the spirit where he invites you to experience firsthand the abundant riches of his grace in a realm that is only accessed safely through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a higher realm that's reflected in the letter Mem, the next letter, which represents an abundance of deep flowing waters. Remember what Jesus said on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which happened 2,000 years ago about this same time of year? He that believes and intersects with my presence 
Out of his innermost being will flow continuously rivers of living water, which John then added, he was speaking about the Holy Spirit, whom everyone that believes on him should receive. And if you permit me to go a little further, where is this higher realm found? It's in the mem, it's in the heavenly waters of eternity that today are separated from the physical realm by a veil, by a firmament that is getting thinner and thinner. The separation is getting thinner and thinner as we approach the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Hebrew word shamayim represents the double mem waters. It's waters with a shin in front of it. A double mem, a double portion of the waters of fire, the fiery waters that Genesis describes as waters that are teeming and abounding with nefesh, kaya, or living souls, or life coming to souls, waiting to find purpose in the physical realm. And we are able to access these rivers of living water because of the blood on the altar. And the very first time the children of Israel offered a sacrifice on the altar, the Bible tells us in Leviticus 9 that the glory of the Lord appeared and there came fire out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the sacrifice on the altar. Heavenly fire supernaturally manifested from the presence of the Lord. And that began the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. Now let's jump ahead and explore the New Testament's version or revelation of how Christ has fulfilled the Day of Atonement in 2024. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 begins with, This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, His unveiling of the divine mysteries. That's the Amplified Classic translation. The word revelation comes from the Greek apocalypsis which is a compound word, the preposition apo, which means off or away, and calupto, the verb, which means to cover or to veil over. In other words, Moses was instructed how to apply the blood on the Day of Atonement to cover over man's sin for one year, a temporary blessing. But Jesus came to take the cover off to remove the veil, and to give you and I the revelation that his death and resurrection has completely fulfilled all the requirements of blood sacrifice. It's no longer necessary. And when he ascended into heaven and purged the heavenly utensils and the heavenly temple with his own blood, your redemption and your salvation was sealed for all time. The act never needs to be repeated we just put faith in the death and shed blood of Jesus Christ. And your name is recorded in the book of life. And then Jesus sums up the unveiling of this mystery in verse 5. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now notice Jesus did not say that he washed sin off of you cleansing you from its stain temporarily. Rather, he said that he has washed you away. Apo is used again, away, once again, washed you from your sins in his atoning blood. Thayer's lexicon says it this way. Apo is the separation of one thing from another by which the union or the fellowship of the two is now broken and destroyed. <laughs> Jesus did not merely wash sin off of you and out of your mind, but he washed you away from all the garbage that your sin has brought in your life. You've been washed away from the power, the authority, and the influence that sin has exercised over you. And you've been redeemed from all the guilt, all the sorrow, and all the shame that your sin has caused. If you will humble and submit your soul on this day of atonement to the cleansing blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You have been washed away in the blood of Christ. In other words, this New Testament revelation is telling us that the blood is taking us someplace. 
If we will receive it, the blood of Christ is progressively moving us forward to arrive at some destination that he has prepared ahead of time. And in fact, the verb used here is in an active participle voice, which means the action already happened once in the past, but it's still continuing now today. It's still operating in your life. Jesus' blood was received in heaven over 2,000 years ago, but it's still working on earth today because the blood is not finished. It's taking you somewhere. But where? Well, let's turn our pages to Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, where the Apostle Paul writes, You have been saved not by works of righteousness which you have done, the Greek ek, the preposition means your salvation did not come out of your works and your deeds and your actions. Remember, on the Day of Atonement, we do no works. We simply humble and submit our souls to the sacrifice and the fire the Lord has provided. And Paul went on to say, but it's according to his mercy that he saved you by or through the Greek preposition dia, through the washing of regeneration, and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. The word for regeneration is the word paling genesia, and it literally means paling to be brought back to the Genesis, the beginning. Brought back to Genesis. Wow. In the first book of the Bible, the first Adam began his life in the garden with the tree of life. And in the last chapter of the Bible... Adam's seed will step into a new eternal garden that's centered around the tree of life. The blood of Christ is bringing us back to the Genesis experience. What happened in the past is happening now. What's going to happen in the future already happened in the past. It's the Olam experience of past, present, and future in eternity is all happening at the same time. God's plan is going to be realized, fully realized by you and me, if we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Because the blood is bringing us someplace. It's bringing us back to Genesis, back to the time when we were naked and uncovered, exposed, and yet innocent and unashamed. Because we had no sense of guilt or inferiority or shame because we were wrapped in the glory of the Father. The blood is bringing us back to Genesis, back to hearing the voice of God, or the Hebrew, the qual, the sound and the vibration of yon heh vav as he is walking in the garden that we share with him. He's bringing us back to the place of unrestrained fellowship, koinonia, intimacy and communication with the Father of love and with his presence and with the sound and the vibrations of his voice that move us into a place of ecstasy and bliss and joy like no other sound. That's where the blood of Christ is leading us, to the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, the anachinosis, the complete change and renovation of your entire life and your soul. The mirror paraphrase says it this way, Jesus Christ unveiled. In other words, this is the complete unveiling of who Jesus is. This is the revelation of God's gift to you, which was wrapped up in Jesus. And may this grace and this peace of Jesus begin to overwhelm you. <laughs> may it take you over and begin to control everything you say and do. It is truly overwhelming when you think about what Christ has done for us. And it's an ongoing and completed action that has freed us once and for all and every day, not just from sin, but also every day from the guilt and the shame that still lingers because of that sin. It's the lingering stain that restrains us and holds us back and moderates our joy and our shalom peace. It's the lingering memories that stop us from totally yielding ourselves to receive the full measure of God's love, his joy, his ecstasy that's only found in his glory and in his presence. To linger means to stay in a place longer than is necessary. Do you know you no longer need to stay in that place? 
to stay in a place longer than necessary because of a reluctance to leave. It's something that lasts longer than it should. It keeps hanging around. It's a persistent memory that lingers on and on. And the demon spirits linger along with it because they enjoy being there watching you torment yourself with sinful memories. But you don't need to continue living this way anymore. You do not have to put up with the voices of demonic entities reminding you of your sin in the past because Christ has washed you away from your sin in his holy blood. Second Corinthians 5 says that God made his son Jesus Christ to be sin for us so that we might now be made the righteousness of God in him through his blood. His blood is taking you somewhere. It's taking you to the place where you finally let go of your past and you fully grasp the reality that in the Father's eyes, you are spotless. He sees you flawless. He sees you without sin because he chooses to see you through the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Verse 14 says that you need to allow Christ's act of love, of his death and resurrection, to now begin to control and compel and take you over so that the life you now live is no longer focused on pleasing yourself or pleasing others or holding on to your past. But instead, your focal point is entirely focused on pleasing Christ in everything you say, in everything you do. Walking in the shalom, living in the shalom. If things are happening that's robbing the peace, I've got to turn away and let the love of Christ take me over once again. And in verse 15, he continues and says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new species of being, one that never existed before. And it's new to you because all the old things have passed away and all things have now become new in his blood. It takes a while to understand what it means to live in a life that no longer is stained by the past. That's looking into eternity for the events in the future. <laughs> Hallelujah. And one translation express it this way. Will you let yourself be a new creation? Will you let yourself evolve into the new person he has prepared for you? Will you allow Jesus to take the cover and the veil off of your eyes so you can begin to see yourself the way the father sees you? Will you humble and submit your soul to this new atonement, this new revelation of Christ and his blood? In Isaiah 6, the prophet Isaiah lamented, Woe to me, I will be destroyed because I am not pure. I am spiritually unworthy because I'm living among people who are not pure. Isaiah was living under the old covenant, but he was just caught up in the spirit under the old covenant. And he saw the throne of God and he saw the seraphim saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The world is filled with his glory. And every time they would say, holy, holy, the balconies and the pillars would begin to shake and the throne room was filled with the cloud of the glory of God. And so Isaiah said, I'm so unworthy, unworthy, unworthy. He experienced this under the old covenant. If he experienced that under the old, what do you think's in store for you <laughs> in the new greater covenant that's greater because it's founded on the blood of Jesus? Well, the Lord turned to one of the seraphim and said, I want you to do this. I want you to go and remove a live coal. He took a tong to remove a live coal from the altar in heaven that has been purged with the blood of Jesus. And he said, now I want you to lay that coal of fire on Isaiah's mouth. And then he said, lo, this coal of fire from the altar of God purged by the blood now touches your lips and your iniquity has been taken away. Your sin has been cut far, purged. Tav kafar, it's written. 
The fire of God has branded you with the tav, with the tav, with the sign or the mark of covenant. And in our case, living under the new covenant, it's the blood of Christ that brings the fire that cleanses our soul and brands us with the mark of covenant. So we can rise up and be baptized continuously every day in this holy fire anointing so we can go wherever he sends us and so we can begin to speak whatever it is he's telling us to say, because the blood of Jesus Christ is taking you someplace. The blood is taking you to a higher place that the Lord has prepared just for you.